Hey guys, welcome to Super Bowl Sunday. Not only is it Super Bowl Sunday of football, but you can hear in the background, my neighbors think it's Super Bowl of Motocross Sunday as well. So that's what all the noise is. Anyway, I am out in my shed and I am putting together the Mississippi Fireball license plate guitar. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, there will be a playlist about this one. It's got ink made out of tree parts, stain in the neck, the plate's been on fire, the body looks like it's been on fire, and errantly, that's the word for the day, errantly, some people think that I have totally given up making cigar box and license plate and coffee cans and guitars. I have not, but you can only make 200 videos about that kind of stuff before people start going, dude, Let's grow this up into something. Anyway, the Super Bowl is being played in Los Angeles, home of the, you know it, California junk pile, and the, where are we at? Oh yeah, Coveter's Paradise. The Harmony Hollywood, look at that pickup. Original stuff. Now, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna dive into the empty swimming pool of repairing arch top guitar necks that are breaking loose. Now, we've talked about, first off, this is going to be a playlist, so this is an introduction. What we're going to accomplish here is to take a look at a couple examples of necks that we've done after I kind of give you a couple links to primer to Econo arch tops. Let's pause for a little bit. And then that second dot that's coming up to write about now is buyer's guide. So when you're all buying these things up, I literally have these stacked up all over the floor around me to get through this episode. But you kind of want to watch those to figure out what you're into, what you're getting into, and whether or not this stuff is worth it. I want to point out this vintage guitar price guide. This is where you're going to find values of guitars like the ones I'm showing you and the ones I'm going to talk about today. Now, some people will look at this and they say, well, this is stacked. Uh, the pricing in this is stacked for guitar shops. Well, newsflash, guitar shops are the people who sell guitars and who are kind of a hub for guitars coming in. People actually trade in their grandpa's guitar to get a better guitar and so if you're into arch tops econo arch tops rather than buying them on the street you get a guitar shop that knows what you're looking for if they're if they kind of know which what, what you're gonna spend um, they might have a few or check in with you when they're taking trade-ins and saying hey you know what I know somebody but nobody is going into all the guitar shops in Los Angeles and buying a 1950s K guitar. That's not really what the market is. So back to this guide. You're going to find out that the prices that you see, the range in here, um, let's pick one of these guitars that I showed you if I can get there without falling down. Oh, by the way, I have a tractor seat stool. Awesome. Awesome. It's metal, but it's awesome. Anyway, if you were to look in the Vintage Guitars price guide for this Harmony Hollywood, you're going to see that the price range in just about any condition, the top end of that's going to be $500. And that's for one that's in functional condition, might have a few scratches and scrapes, but it's got the original pickup, original bridge, and um, no cracks or splits or major repairs. Now. It will tell you right in the guide that the top end price is for something that someone would buy and say, this thing is pretty solid. It's got all the parts and stuff. But say, for example, I replaced the bridge or the pickup. I'm going to lose 50% of the value of the guitar regardless of the quality uh, uh, or what the pickup or bridge is. If I reset the neck, regardless if it's perfect job, couldn't get any better. That is also going to reduce the price about 50%. If your neck job is terrible, 
um, yeah, now now you're batting zero. And so what you want to look at right out of the chute is if you're looking at buying one of these, if you're thinking that it's a $500 guitar, that means it's got the original tuners, the neck has never been reset, it's not breaking loose, it's got the original pickup, bridge, tailpiece, electronics, and that you can plug it in and it works okay and it plays okay. If it doesn't have any of those things and you're paying $350 and $400 for one, there's not much room for you. Now, if you buy it at $400 and you think you're going to sell for $450 and you're driving around for two days and, and putting a little bit of work into it, there's not going to be any money in it for you. So realize that right away. Now, let's say that I buy this guitar for $150. That's not going to happen if it's got the pickup on it because as long as the tuners are good, the neck is in one piece, even if it's detached from the guitar, the bridge, the tailpiece, yeah, you're not going to be able to buy those parts for $150. Again, refer to the episodes up there about Econo Arch Top Guitars and buying one. I think I'll throw those in a playlist so they're together. You know, I make videos and, and um, you know, five years later, I'll look back and there's 70,000 hits on them. So that's kind of what happens. Don't expect my stuff to be relevant as I get smarter about this and I got a long ways to go still. But anyway, let's say that the action on this one is pretty high. This one isn't. But I decide this next stuff is too rough for me. I can't do it. So I'm going to take this guitar that I paid $150 for, which, by the way, I didn't pay that for this. But let's say that I did and take it into a luthier, the luthier is going to want to charge me somewhere around $400 to do the neck reset. And by the time I've got the price I paid for it and the neck reset, it's not going to be worth what the guitar price guide says it's worth. And then on top of that, because I've had the neck reset, the price is right back down to $250 on something that looks cherry. So... Don't forget that. We're going to go through a couple of guitars that you've seen before. I'm going to show you what caused me to make the decision to run a bolt through them or to do absolutely nothing. And then ultimately what affected my decision to start off with kit guitars instead of playing with these necks. We're going to end this episode by me showing you a couple of things that you're going to need if you're going to be silly enough to accompany me down the, pay, the trail of we're going to take a, a guitar that I bought that I think is worth quite a bit of money, but the action is up this high, we are going to actually do a neck reset ourselves, and we're going to build the tools that we need for the most part to do the neck reset. So this is an intro to this. The next few episodes in the playlist will be how to build a steamer and how to build the press that pops the necks off and then a little bit about the tools you're going to need between uh, the operations. And then finally we'll see what it takes to put a neck back on and have it turn out right with running a bolt through it. So let's have a couple uh, guitars pop up on the screen. You're familiar with them if you subscribe to my channel. If you don't then do that below and uh, then we'll get into to, onto the tool bench and figure out how to get this project started. All right, so when I started having a second look at, I'm spending a lot, a lot of time uh, building up necks and bolting them and uh, kind of sentencing them to the value that they are just because I made them and put my stuff on them and do whatever I do. Uh, a wise old luthier told me, you know what, why don't you start off with something dependable and instead of trying to fix these things up and worrying about, you know, how you're going to put structural steel inside of them, just start off with something and then don't be afraid to be an artist and do what you do. So these pocket neck guitars, this thing is solid. It's a kit guitar. It looks like one of my guitars. And, um, you might want to go down that route if you are serious about putting out guitars 
where you don't have to worry about the value of it dropping in half. Now this one does not have the nostalgic value coming out of the kit. Of course, when I start putting pieces of wood in it out of where Sun House recorded, where Mississippi Fred McDowell was found by uh, George Mitchell, uh, pieces of wood of, uh, from Alan Wilson that helped Sun House relearn his songs, and um, a piece of wood from Reuben Lacey where all this slide music started with Sun House, and then, you know, that kind of stuff, parchment, penitentiary, coins, that kind of stuff, we get into a whole new world, and that's beyond what this neck resetting is about. So think about that if you're really worried about getting into these necks. Can you do kit guitars and produce the kind of product you want without worrying about necks? So that's something for you to think about right away. If that's not for you, then let's get into the world of what these guitars are really worth and what resetting a neck does to the value. Okay, let's start off with old number 12. This guitar, I ended up doing some work for, yeah, you saw me with my glasses on, that's rare. Um, this guitar ended up in my hands because I did some work for an artist um, and he ended up with the Archcraft junk pile and um, the restaurant junk pile and a coffee can. So at some point along the way, I acquired this guitar which had been on the road with this artist and been through, look, broken neck. See that neck plate front and back. Um, look at, there's more hardware on that neck. Look at all those screws, shelf brackets, everything else on this neck. The action is okay. Those are original pickups and it's got the original knobs and everything. But this guitar has literally been through hell and rather than resetting the neck, it got bolted and screwed on. And there's so many bolts and stuff here. If you were to take this off, it would probably fall apart. Now, once I got it, I put some Gibson tuners on it and stuff. And this is a great guitar. It's not going anywhere. So forget about that. But this is not a candidate for a neck reset. Next thing, you remember the California junk pile? Oh, I think all these guitars... I'm going to put them in a playlist so you'll see Restaurant Junk Pile, um, California Junk Pile, any guitar I'm going to show you here. If I did a video on anything I did to it, I'll put it in the playlist. Anyway, the California Junk Pile student instrument came to me neck pretty high, action pretty high. This was an acoustic guitar, a student guitar. It's trending towards the 40s because it's still got not a sharp V-neck, but kind of a V-neck. I put all kinds of scrap apparatus on it. You've seen uh, Frank Goldwasser play this one. I'll give you a little clip of that if I can. Again, just hover the, the up there and that where that eye is and whatever I can load up, I will. But this started off with a very low... A fingerboard where it attached to the body. There's not a lot of room there uh, to do this one. And so if the neck's cutting loose on this, I just ran a bolt through it and called it a day. Now, at best, this guitar, no binding, had some cracks on the side, pit guard gone, different bridge, electronics added to it. If you start getting into this, this guitar is worthless. Now, in a shop, somebody might look at this and go, oh, this is one of Ken's guitars. This is cool. If I'm at a blues festival and people are coming by and Gallia Volt has just played one of my guitars on stage, now we're talking a little bit different retail value. But this is what it is, and it would certainly not be worth a neck reset. Now, what else do we have here? Oh, this is a mid-range in terms of price, silver tone. Um, it's got binding that's painted on. Um, it's got all the original parts. Um, it's in pretty good shape. 
but the neck's starting to cut loose. So, it's got the original tuners, did I say that already? Um, but I'm going to kind of keep this one and figure out after a few neck resets, um, am I going to do this one because it will stay in the family. It's got that kind of V neck, so it's earlier in the 50s than it is later in the 50s. It's certainly not a 60s guitar, uh, but this one's, this one's in good shape. But as soon as I take the neck off, let's say it was worth $350 or $400 or even $500, suddenly it becomes worth $250 even if everything is perfect. So don't get the idea that you're going to do a neck reset and suddenly it's worth $700 because it's not. Now, let, sh let me show you a couple guitars that I think are worth a neck reset if that were the case, if they needed it. This is a Harmony Patrician. It was made in 1940. The reason I know it was made in 1940 is because somebody in corporate in 1940 said, this has real binding, somebody in corporate said, hey, we can save some production costs if we only put binding on the top. So this one has no binding along the bottom edge. That is the only year they did it. It has the original bridge. The action is okay. Original tuners. Everything is still here. This guitar is worth $500 the way it is. Now, if the neck suddenly broke loose on this thing, this to me would be worth doing a neck reset. I can't afford to pay a luthier to do it and maintain my value. But if I can do it myself, that is something I would be interested in. So that one is a, is a possible candidate. Let's make sure that doesn't fall off there because then it will be worth $22 like the rest of my guitars. Now I want to talk to you about this one. This is a The Prep guitar. The Prep. I don't know whether they were thinking kids that were thinking about going to college would do something or whatever. But this is a nice guitar. It has the V-neck. It's got really cool inlays. Um, the neck being this narrow. The butter bean tuners. The original sticker. This guitar is worth in the neighborhood of $500 in any kind of condition. Now, it didn't come with that roller bridge that's four feet above the deck that's pushing down on the top of the guitar. It does have the original tailpiece, but if you look at this, what's really going on here is the neck is starting to cut loose. There's a gap there, and it's kind of like a student instrument in a way because it's got that very low fretboard. There's not another board underneath there. Um, what I did with a guitar called the, the Ibanez Junk Pile, I actually took the fingerboard off, put another piece of fretboard underneath here, and got things up higher. Uh, but this one has everything original. The neck is starting to collapse into the top of the... Uh, soundboard up on top so this will be the one we are going to do a neck reset on because what I paid for this guitar um, I don't have much into it let's put it that way and it's still solid enough for me to come out with something and in the worst case scenario when it's done if everything fails I can jack the the arch top back mm. up and fix just about anything that's wrong with this and make it into a junk pile of some blues players would love to have. So, the moral of the story on all this uh, me yapping on on the front end of this is neck resets are expensive. They're labor intensive and when a luthier does one, they don't know what's in here. So, for example, let's say someone had put a screw in here and then hit it with very clever work and you start taking this off and you figure out that the screw, whoever put it in, run through the V-notch and broke half the V-notch off. You start getting into those kinds of things, and the luthier is left going, I can't do anything with this, and your guitar is apart. So it's a risky, labor-intensive, specialty-type work that people are going to want to be paid for. So um, 
if you're going to make the decision to dive into that empty swimming pool, don't blame the luthier if, if the th kind of things I'm telling you actually happen. Now, let's take a look, a closer look at this one and kind of get some preliminary ideas about what you have to do to do uh, to get the neck off of one of these, what kind of hand tools you're going to need to get started, and then we're going to talk about in upcoming episodes about how to build you a steamer and how to build the press to pop this neck off. Let's take a look at this, the prep on the bench. All right, we got this guitar up on the bench. Let's take a look at what we know about it. We know that it has a decal that says the prep. Uh, we know that it's got a very skinny headstock. It's not much wider than the fretboard up here. Um, it looks like the nut has been replaced, but it has what appear to be the original, let's flip this over, butter bean tuners with the open um, gear tuner configuration. Now, if you look down the neck here, let me move this up. I got bean bags out. This is not really, really pronounced um, a V, but it's more V than not. It's it's not as curved um, as uh, some of the oldest ones, but I personally think this is somewhere from the 30s, from what I can tell by snooping around on the internet and finding things that you would find yourself. It was made under the brand Supertone for Sears by the Harmony Guitar Company. There's some similarities to a, a Harmony Patrician that I showed you a little bit earlier in this episode, but um, in terms of the fingerboard, the, the fingerboard is short. There's not a double section of it onto the body up here. Can you see up here? Maybe not. There we go. That's much better. Um, the wear on the fingerboard here is from people's fingernails. Um, and that's it for this part of the guitar. So let's turn it around here and have a look at what else we see. Okay, I know the camera angle isn't helping me out much here, but bear with me. This is the original uh, tailpiece. It's kind of odd. It doesn't have a third uh, screw down here that anchors this down into here. You would expect to see that, but um, it has uh, flathead screws in it and just old, old stuff. Um, when you start looking at this roller bridge, this thing did not come with a roller bridge like this, and that roller bridge is sitting, let's flip this around, about the strings on the roller bridge about 35 millimeters off of the deck. You can see that the deck is squatting down right here. In terms of how the, the, the sound board or the top of this, there's a crack right here starting along the F hole. And then when you get down into, let me move this around for you a little bit. In this area right here, you can see that this drops down. That's way more than it should. And there's a gap right up here. Let me get some things out of the way and see if I can't spin this around for you. This gap right here, right there, is very telltale because it says this is sinking down and letting this come, come up. And that gap right there is equivalent to the gap you're seeing right there. The back of the guitar is starting to come loose here. It's actually detached from here and up here which tells us if it's detached here and up here, everything is twisting one way or another. So this thing is kind of in rough shape. But the worst part about this is, is you look at the string action, it is sky high, and a ton of that has to do with the roller bridge here. So if we were to drop this down, uh, it would basically, you'd be running... Uh, four millimeters here and your string action would be very high so putting heavy strings on this even a slide guitar player wouldn't want this so what we're looking at here is we would have to do some body work we would put everything back together oh, I want you to notice here this is not binding this is paint and there is no binding 
here. So um, it's got the original pit guard. Um, it has the original pit guard bracket. These are Econo stuff because um, flat-headed screws. But this is a vintage guitar. Now, why would I reset the neck on this one? Well, for what I paid for... Oh, I want you to notice here. These inlays are really cool. Well, it's really cool to do inlays like that if you're just putting a stencil out and painting them. Those are painted on. Nothing about this guitar is special. This is a Christmas guitar. Um, but if it were in any kind of condition, it would be worth about $500. So what we're going to do mm -hmm. is we're going to take everything off. We're going to retain the original pieces, which is the tuners. We're going to watch out for the headstock. Uh, the nut, I, I don't expect I would find a replacement for this nut anywhere, so it would be good. Uh, but we are going to have to take the neck off of this thing we're going to have to do some work on the body and that includes work on the sides and the top and the cracks and rehydrate this thing so we're basically going to have to pivot this neck back up and in order to do that we're going to have to do some work right there all right let's start with where the neck attaches to the body and that is right there so you got to kind of trace down like this all glues in there we know that um, they used hide glue which if you heat up um, it will come loose and so you have to kind of look at where the edge of the guitar is the body is and where it meets the neck and then where most likely the glue joint is and it would be right here so we're one two three four five six seven eight 9, 10, 11, 12, there's a 12th fret right there, 13, 14, so on this guitar the glue joint is going to be under the 15th fret. So what you end up doing is you end up taking this fret out, prying it up, now you remember you're going to want to put it back in, um, so just popping it out of there and pulling everything loose is going to be a bad deal. So the first thing you want to do is you want to be able to protect things, so you have these fret protectors they come for when you're dressing frets or whatever but you have a special set of pliers and if you look at these they're narrowed here and here they're almost like uh, uh, fret pliers but these are pullers so what ends up happening is you work them under the edge and because they're graduated in how everything is formed right here, they have a tendency to want to pull up. So once you get to here, what, what ends up happening is you squeeze this, it doesn't try to cut, it tries to push the fret up. And then as you get the fret worked loose, you have these things that fit here, like so, and then you use these as kind of a leverage point. Let me get this on here like this. And when that starts popping up, then you can take this and squeeze up and you start off with the thinner one and the thicker one. So these are tools for popping frets out. They're expensive, but if you're going to do much of this, you're going to want these because they preserve the tang, they preserve uh, what's going on here. And then you can reuse this stuff with maybe a little bit of glue or I don't want to get into all that. But these are worth their weight in gold. If you tar start taking a screwdriver and popping them out of there, you're going to ruin everything. Now, I have seen people steam off neck. So here's kind of what's going to happen. Once you get this fret out, you're going to drill two holes down in here, one here and one here, within the fret slot. Okay, You don't want to use some big bit where it makes a big hole over here. It's going to be something that's small that will fit an inflator needle, which I'll get to in the next episode. But um, I've seen people try and steam these off, and nothing seems to cut loose because they don't take this off. This is always glued to the top of the guitar right here. It is different from the glue joint. So what you end up doing is you need a heat source. You need to protect this. That could be with tape. It could be with rags, something like this. But you take a knife like this. They call these pallet knives. They come in different sizes. And just like with the the hide glue that holds the neck on, there's hide glue under here. So you basically take an iron or, or a hot plate like this. My camera angle isn't the best. 
but you heat up these by putting the blade on there till it warms up and then of course this pit guard would be gone but you basically come in and pry this loose with heat of course you're going to protect everything here and then once you get this loose then it's time to start thinking about popping the neck off a couple things you want to know know about before you get started so again you want frat removal pliers the shims that go with them to kind of give you leverage as the fret starts to come out and you want pallet knives in a way to heat it to get this loose then you can start worrying about steaming off the neck okay one more time on the basic tools we're going to want some tape this thing is an awesome tape holder you just flip this down like this and you pull your tape off and it cuts it you flip it back up this is awesome binding jobs it's it's great for everything so one of those is handy of course you want something a neck call or a stand uh, to work your stuff off of you want rags okay um, this hot plate is not on so don't worry about it you're going to want uh, palette knives and a way to heat those up like this to get the bottom part of the fingerboard off of the body, which has nothing to do with the neck connection. I've got a few of these. Um, and most importantly, to pull frets out, you're going to want a way to protect your frat board. So you know what these are. You put a, a rubber band around it here and here to file your frets. You've seen those before. Uh, but most importantly, you want fret pulling pliers because... You can basically put them under the fret, squeeze them a little bit, and they start working that up, and you just walk your way down like this, and because they're graduated there, they'll start working the fret loose. Um, it also sometimes helps to take your palette knife, heat it up, and then put it on the fret. That will help cut the glue loose if there is any there. And then once that starts to come up, you take your graduated... Um, spacers here shims and put those on and then th those will give you an extra leverage point to work this up and then when they start cutting loose you you move up to the thicker one and then you just pull those out so these are the tools you'll need if you're going to do much of this let's get ahead of ourselves a little bit again the hot plates not on we're going to pull this I've got this piece of uh, sample fretted fingerboard so I'm going to take my fret pliers here my fret pulling pliers and I'm just going to get under there and pry this up and look it came right out but it came straight out so the tangs and everything are still intact now okay now that that slot is open I'm going to drill down through the fret board until I find the pocket in the neck you'll be able to tell when you hit it and then let me flip this around. This wouldn't be like this on a guitar. I'm going to do the same thing where I end up with two slots, okay? Now, the idea is not to make those so giant that when you put the, the fret back in, that it doesn't hide it like so, or that it's so big from the onset that it splits the fingerboard. You don't want that. But we'll get into this when we actually do this. But now comes a time where we have to figure out how to inject steam in here. Now we're going to talk about how to build a steamer, the parts you'll need ahead of time, and the uh, neck puller that clamps onto the body. So we'll have a quick look at a couple things you'll, you'll need in the future if you're going to follow along and build this stuff with us. So you're going to be looking for a West Bend two and a half quart aluminum teapot. You don't have to have one of these, but if you want to be cool, you do because the best things come from Wisconsin. I come from Wisconsin. Apparently my camera angle didn't come from Wisconsin, but we're going to fix one of these up where it will inject steam into here. So that will be the first project in the playlist so if you can find one of these or something like it do that before the next episode and like i said expect the prices of these to start running up when people are ordering them ordering them on ebay 
Good luck finding one of these now on eBay for less than $20. Okay, the second thing we need to do is to get a good piece of plywood. This one is 24 by 24 by 3 quarters of an inch thick. And what we're looking for is one that is big enough to cut down the middle that will hold the guitar body like so. We're going to put the heel out just a little bit right here and then we'll be able to trace around and come to this part of the guitar like so. So we'll lay this on here, we'll trace this around and come just a little bit past this point here you see that and we need to be able to cut two of them like so so let's get this out of the way so half, half of it would be here and the guitar body would be reflected to there and over here and one here and here and they would flop onto each other so think about getting a good piece of plywood don't cheap out on this because you'll be able to use it more than once and once you got those things, watch the next couple of episodes, and we're going to take the uh, neck off of a guitar using tools we made ourselves. Okay, there it is. Um, you can choose to follow me down this rabbit hole, uh, and but don't blame me when you start buying stuff and making stuff, and at the end of it, it's like that didn't work out. And if you got somebody nagging you in the background, that's on you. That's not on me. Every mother-in-law I ever had was a Sagittarius, remember that. But if you are going to decide to maybe do this, you be looking at them swap meet uh, yard sale things for that teapot and go get you a piece of wood. Now, you want to remember, when I tell you about something, I remember when I started, I was buying up Mississippi trailer house plates because I was building guitars that said house on them, like Sun House. Well, I didn't tell everybody about that. And I got my share of house plates laying around here, believe you me, and don't covet me for that. But the minute you start buying up West Bend two and a half quart teapots and everybody figures out that you're watching Ken, there's going to be a run on this stuff where... It would have been like buying Echo Bay mine stock in 1970. Anyway, look that one up. So get your stuff, get your stuff early, and shh, don't be telling everybody. You don't want to be paying 50 bucks for a teapot. Because as soon as you have a teapot, people are going to start asking questions. What, did you start drinking tea, mate? All right. <laughs> we're way off down the weeds now. Look for the next episode where we're going to take that teapot and turn it into a steamer. And then if we get through that without blowing ourselves up, then we'll build a press to pull the neck off. I will see you soon. Thanks for watching. Give me a like and subscribe if you haven't. Later.